morning. My name is John Williamson. I work for the state of Florida, Department of Health. Almost 33 years ago, I started working as a radio chemist. And I've worked my way up the last 15 years. I've been the administrator of the environmental section for the Bureau of Radiation Control. Um, I supervise eight statewide programs, including medical reserve corps training and emergency response. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is meter and portal operations. Now, of all the modules that you've seen thus far this morning, this one is going to be the one that you're going to be required to do the most work on. And it's because what I'm going to talk about isn't necessarily the equipment that you have in your jurisdiction. I'm gonna give some examples, and there's some general examples of the types of meters that we're gonna see, types of portal monitors, but undoubtedly, you don't have everything that I have and I don't have everything that you have. So you're gonna to have to go back and you're gonna to have to work on that. Here's an example. Um, does, it, does everybody know what type of portal monitors you have in your jurisdictions? Okay, so Thermos, Ludlums, Johnsons. So, you know, those are the three most common types. And I actually have presentations for the Thermo and the Johnson but of course, irony being what it is, Tennessee has Ludlums. So we're gonna talk about looking at thermos today, but then what we're actually gonna use in the exercises later is the, thermo, uh, the, the Ludlum models. Okay, the objectives we're gonna go for, by the end of this module, we're gonna understand screening with a handheld survey meter, understand the use of dosimetry equipment, understand the use of a portal monitor, um, as considerations I've already mentioned, every jurisdiction is gonna have its own equipment, models, and makes, and you're going to have to make sure that you customize your presentation for what equipment you have in your own jurisdictions. Screening with a handheld monitor, okay? Most of your handheld screening is gonna be done with a handheld monitor, it gives you a more appropriate ways of screening. However, there are many different specific types of models available. Um, we're gonna talk about checking the batteries, checking the calibration, full body screening, and partial body screening. Chris has already covered a lot of that. Um, a lot of this is driven by what your resources are and how many people you have to screen. If you don't have portal monitors and you have 100,000 people to screen, you're probably not gonna be doing whole body screening with handheld monitors. You're gonna be doing the quick and dirty hands, feet, shoulders, and the face and neck region. If on the other hand, you have 10 people, then you can do as thorough a job as you need to do. Let's talk about a definition of what a survey meter is. It's a portable handheld electronic instrument that's used to detect radiation, oftentimes called a Geiger counter. There's two different types of meters that we can talk about. We can have dose rate meters. We can have count rate meters. Okay, there are some instruments that will do both. If you take a pancake, a common count rate meter, and you put a filter on it to give it dose equivalency, and it's calibrated for that dose equivalency. You can do both the count rates and dose rates. However, please don't make the mistake of thinking that just because you have two, two scales shown on your screen, one for counts per minute and one for MR per hour, that you can suddenly take a pancake and read an MR per hour. You can only do that if you have a dose filter on it and it's calibrated for, for dose rate as well. Oftentimes we call count rate meters. We call them friskers or pancakes, and it's because it looks like a pancake spatula. You can have ones that would connect to it, like this, uses the cable to connect to it. You can have ones like this, it's all in one meter. You can have even simpler designs where it's on the back of it. Thermo also makes one called the Rad-Eye B20 that also has a 
Fresco station built into the back of it. For handheld screening, on almost all cases, a pancake is gonna be what you're gonna use. You could use alpha meters, but alpha meters have a very, very tender window. If you happen to touch something with it, you're probably gonna poke a hole in the window. Most pancake meters, on the other hand, do have a grid to protect that meter face from being damaged. They typically read in counts per minute. They have about a two inch active area. Uh, they're sensitive to alphas, betas, and gammas. Obviously with alphas, you're going to have to be very, very close, a half inch or less to the surface. Uh, betas and gammas, commonly you'll see them used on those. Um, how can you differentiate between betas and gammas? Betas, the window is toward the source. To do a gamma, simply can turn it over and use the screening on that to screen out the betas. For the 2401P, betas facing it, turn it on the side or this way to do the gamma readings. For your Ludlum model, same thing. Toward the source, betas, away from it, gammas. They are very easy to calibrate and operate. The functional parts of this meter, the detector, part like this. Um, as I mentioned, has a window in it to protect it from um, environmental material that you might get into it. You can break these windows though, so you wanna be careful when using it. Uh, one trick that you'll see is that people are using it screening. They'll oftentimes put their fingers around the edge and then they'll run their fingers along when they're doing the screening. Obviously, if you're doing contamination screening of a person, uh, you're gonna be wearing gloves and you're gonna have to be very careful about not touching them because then you might be bringing contamination onto your hand. You get contamination into the detector and everybody is going to be hot from then on. Oftentimes you might find that you wanna cover these detectors with a plastic bag. If you tend to show contamination and you wonder whether you're contaminated, if you move away from the person and the detector continues to go off, then you're pretty clear that you've got contamination on the outside bag, change the bag out, put a new one on it, and then it should go back down to background levels. The dial or the readout, there's a face on each one of these. You have two different types of readouts. You can have an analog face, which is it actually has a series of scales. You have to read across the scales. When you have an analog face, typically uh, the meter actually needs to be set to a particular scale. And then when it goes off scale, you have to turn it to the next scale. Um, your older meters, dating all the way back to your civil defense instruments, and some of the old Ludlum meters all used analog scales where you'd have to change the scale when you overranged it. Um, newer meters, display face is built into this one. This is a digital scale, it's auto ranging. So you don't have to change the scale on it. And also typically your digital meters have much higher rates of count, much higher allowable count rates that you can use on them as well. The reset button, if you have an analog meter and it has different scales and you tend to collect too many counts on that range and it tends to go off scale, um, you may have to step back from your source, press the reset button and that dumps all the charges that are on that detector and sets it back to zero and allows you to start collecting new, new, new counts on the meter. The speaker, uh, all radiation detectors should have some type of a noise maker. Now, when you're talking about using a noise maker detector and a CRC, this is something that you have to decide very carefully because is it going to alarm the people you have in there if they hear a radiation detector clicking? 
Um, on the other hand, if you're having to screen somebody and you're like me and you can't see that meter face without glasses on, you might want the sound on it to hear when you're moving, some, moving over, over there doing the screening. Consider this one, you're watching the meter and you're screening with this one, then there's a chance that you're gonna touch them with this. On the other hand, you probably wanna be watching to make sure that you're screening the right parts and not touching them. So how do you know what's going on with the meter unless you keep looking back and forth? You might wanna be using the volume. It's a, your own decisions on what you're gonna do on it, but it's something to consider anyhow. So speakers on the side, yes sir? Is there an earpiece? It depends on what meter you have. This is the Ludlum 26.1. It does not have an earpiece. The Ludlum Model 26.3, you pay more money and you get a headphone jack. Uh, CDV 700s, the old civil defense instruments, they all had a jack that you could use a headset with. Um, most of your Ludlum ones, which were designed for industrial use, don't have a jack. So first when you pick up the survey meter, you wanna take a look at it. Look at it externally, see whether you see any damage to it. If you see obvious damage, don't plan on using that particular meter. It may be difficult, but you should look at the probe window and see if you can see any obvious damage to the window. Um, if you have a hole in that window, the meter is probably going to go off no matter what you do, no matter where you are, because you're letting light into that detector and it's going to cause it to uh, alarm all the time. A calibration sticker. Most meters are gonna be calibrated once a year. Somewhere on the outside of the meter, you should have a calibration sticker. It should have the date calibrated and then you'll add one year to that. Battery checks. All of these meters have a function where they can, all the analog meters actually have a switch area where you can turn it to battery check and it will show you the charge on the battery. Your digital meters typically do a self check on the battery and then they have an indicator on the top of them that shows you what the battery charge is. One thing about the battery check, on at least most of the Ludlum instruments, if you leave it in the battery check position, it continues to click, but the meter readings don't mean anything at all. So you wanna make sure that you turn it off of the battery to the actual function mode. So, when you get a survey meter, first thing you wanna do, remove the plastic cap, unless you're looking to use it as an exposure meter. Um, it mentions there about the considerations for what isotopes you're using. The only time that you wouldn't cover your probe with a plastic bag is if you're interested in doing alphas. Um, there is, These probes will detect alpha, betas, and gammas. If you cover it, you won't see alphas. If you cover it, you won't see tritium or carbon-14 or phosphorus-32, but those are all such low energy betas that it's unlikely you're going to see them anyhow unless you're right on top of the material. So you might as well protect your instrument, go ahead and cover it with a plastic bag. Uh, in most of your scenarios that you're looking at, strontium-90, cesium-137 from power plants, those are easily going to go through anything except a very heavy uh, garbage bag, so you might as well cover it. Um, any of your gamma emitters, cesium, of course, cobalt, they have gamma rays as well, so they're going to penetrate that bag. So protect your meter, use bags. Yes, sir. So does the bag need to be sealed? It is always recommended, at the very least, you should use a rubber band to, to tie it around it. 
because you don't want loose particulate matter. Consider if you're screening somebody's feet, the orientations you might have on that bag, you may be able to knock something off their feet into the bag. So at least, you know, most people will suggest taping it on. Um, the problem is if you're routinely contaminating a taped on bag, it's an onerous process to untape that, put a new bag on and then retape it. A rubber band on the other hand works really well and it comes off easily. Yeah, and cheap. Many meters will actually give you a radioactive source on the side of it so that you can do an instrument check when you get that meter. The Johnson DSM 525 got a source built in on the side. This does not, which means that you would have to, by FEMA regulations, provide a source so that they can do a source check with it. And then in addition to the source, you would also provide a note card that said that what the response you would expect to see with that. Um, depending on how you do this, you can either put a source with every single meter or you can have a whole box of meters ready to go to a particular location. You have one source and then you have an equipment specialist who will check out all of those meters before they issue them out to the people using them in the CRC. Check the background levels. I mentioned if you have a hole in the detector, you're gonna have high background levels. Uh, can anybody tell me on a typical Frisker meter, what kind of type of background do you expect to see? How many counts per minute? About 50. If it's more than 50, you might have a problem with the detector. In a lot of areas, in Florida, for instance, our backgrounds typically are more like 20 to 25. Um, if you're in a very low background because of the limestone base on our, we don't have the uranium based rocks. Uh, in Tennessee, you guys are in an area that has more natural uranium, your background's probably gonna be higher. But you should, in a background area, check what your meter says that's gonna tell you whether the meter is functioning properly. There should be some type of a card that might be issued to record the information on that, on that particular monitor. Um, if you're gonna be surveying people and telling them that they're going to be okay or that they need additional treatment, you're gonna want some type of a record to make sure that that instrument was operating properly when you got that. Because when they sue in the end, you're gonna want all the documentation that you had. It's possible, not absolutely, but it's possible. You should be prepared for it to be part of an official record. You know, um, Chris talked about the monitoring that the United States government did after the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, that was uh, 75, 80 years ago now and we, we still have those survivors in a registry. If something happens in the United States, is there any doubt in your mind that you will have a registry from now until the day they die? And you know, you, you have a, somebody who's born today, they could very easily live to be 100 years old. So you know that registry is gonna list for 100 years. So you are going to be adding your own records to something that people will be reading 100 years from now. So be very careful about what you write and be very thorough. Where do you use contamination survey equipment? Locating contamination on personnel and equipment, determining the boundaries of a contaminated area. You have a dirty bomb, it spews out radioactive material. Do you just set 
your limits by what a dose rate line, say two MR per hour, or are you concerned about contamination as well? Well, you're gonna be concerned about not just dose rate, but also the contamination. You don't want people tracking that contamination and then taking it home with them, doing the same thing the little girl at Goyanya did, having a sandwich with their hands contaminated, determining the effectiveness of the decontamination. After you've surveyed somebody and they've been washed, you're gonna be getting your meters right back out and you're gonna be checking them to make sure that you actually decontaminated them properly. Your instrument background is normally between 50 and 100. If it's above 50, that's really a pretty unusual circumstance to have background readings that high, but it's possible. Uh, we mentioned scales on analog meters. Make sure you use the proper scale. Um, depending on whether you're talking about health physics people or medical people, some people say start at the lowest scale and work your way up. Some people say start at the highest scale and work your way down. Because we're talking about people where we're considering twice background levels or 300 counts above background for nuclear power plant accidents, by definition, that essentially means you start at the lowest scale and you work your way up. If they exceed the lowest scale, the lowest scale is usually 500 counts a minute. They've already reached the area where they need to be decontaminated. So start at the low scale and work your way up on that. Hold, hold the probe half inch or so from the surface and slowly one to two inches per second. My DOE friends refer to it as turbo frisking. Don't do turbo frisking. Turbo frisking is surveying somebody like this. Okay, you're done. One to two inches per second. Chris mentioned three to five minutes to do a complete whole body frisk with the handheld frisker. That's why portal monitors are so useful. You know, 10 to 30 seconds and you can do the same thing. We talked about use of headphones. Do you want the noise on or not? It's a function of what is most efficient for you versus the concerns of the people who are in that facility. Any sustained in increase above background level should be investigated. So you're moving over one to two inches per second, you suddenly hear it spike up. You just keep right on going because it didn't reach to twice background? No, you slow down, back up, see if you can duplicate it and get an actual count rate on it. When is something contaminated? I just gave you two sets of figures and they are from FEMA Rep 22, nuclear power plants, 300 counts per minute above background. And this is predominantly because they know what the isotopes are from nuclear power plants. That's strontium 90 and cesium 137, and then some noble gases and Ida 131. Correct, I, I, I would agree with that, but um, this comes into what the FEMA standards are, and it also comes into looking at what your capabilities are at decontaminating something. If you have 100,000 people and you only have 20 people to do that contamination screening, are you gonna set your levels at twice background? The answer is no, that's not a realistic goal to be able to screen for that. Um, one of the examples, at Fukushima, their screening criteria was 100,000 DPMs, approximately 33,000 counts per minute. They had 300,000 people they had to screen, so you know, we're gonna give you a starting criteria, nuclear power plant, 300 counts a minute, uh, per minute above background. For other situations, 50 counts, uh, twice background, you know, so 100 counts a minute. But your situation, your scenario, is gonna really determine how closely you're gonna to stick to those. And 
you know, a citizen is going to tell you that anything is too much. Well, I can only do so much. You know, go home, take a shower, and then come back and we'll screen you again. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, you remove the outer layer of clothing. That's 90% of the contamination that you've already removed there. Um, typically after that, if you wash the hands and the face and the neck area, you've removed another 90% of what's left. Radiation dose rate instruments. Measure the ambient radiation levels, locating sources of radiation, control zone boundaries. What are we talking about? Dose rate instrument. Typically, dose rate instruments are gonna measure gamma only, although one of these with the filter can also do it. There's a variety of radiation dose rate instruments. Um, they're all gonna be used with the detector in front of you, typically held out at arm's length. And why would you want to hold it at arm's length? That's right, distance. Keep your body's trunk from distance from the radiation source. You're going to be moving it slowly from side to side, trying to find the highest value that you can. And keep in mind, when you're using an exposure rate meter, that radiation can be from anywhere. Could be on the roof. Meter's got to go up. Could be on the floor below you, meter's gotta go down. Could be behind you and your body is shielding it. So, you know, in a 360 degree circle, all directions. And also keep in mind that if you need to find additional ways of finding where a source is, you can use your own body as a shield to determine where, it, so you have it out here, it's a high dose, dose rate, you bring it in here, and suddenly the dose rate goes down a great deal, you know your body is now shielding it, which means that the radiation source must be somewhere behind you. Otherwise you would have seen it out, you would have seen it in here. And then you can rotate around to do the same thing. There's a variety of different types of dose rate meters. Uh, Canberra makes one, it's a mil spec. Um, if you're a CRC and somebody has given you a lot of problems and they attack you, you can take this instrument and you can beat them with it because it's built like that. Um, Canberra originally started it about 15 years ago, started as a mini radiac, and then went to the ultra radiac, and now the ultra radiac plus. Uh, they're getting ready to phase it out and go to another instrument. But it's a, been a real reliable, uh, energy compensated, so it gives you actual dose rate, a gamma dose rate instrument. Canberra is going to what they now call their Accurad. It's actually a PRD, a personal radiation detector. Uh, this one has a, a GM detector in it. This one has two detectors. It has a silicone pen diode to give you high range and dose rates. And then it has a cesium iodide to give you a scintillator-based low, low, low rate sensitivity. Uh, the great thing about these, these are auto-ranging instruments. They're digital displays. They will work both as dose instruments and as dosimeters. You can actually record the dose on these as well. So dose or dose rate with these instruments. Um, another one made by Thermo, the Rad-Eye PRD. They make a whole different variety of these. Uh, some of the PRDs only go up to 15 MR. Uh, 15 MR per hour, some of them go all the way up to 10 R per hour. So another type of instrument that does you that. Dosimetries, I gave you two DRDs, oftentimes they're called DRD, direct reading dosimeter, SRD, self reading dosimeter, or PIC, pocket ion chamber. Uh, they come in a wide variety. The two that I gave you, I gave you a 0 to 200 R and a 0 to 100 R. They also come like 0 to 500 MR, 0 to 200 MR, which are much more useful for most of the scenarios. Uh, they use, uh, you essentially generate an electrical charge on them. They have a little post that shows up in there. And then as radiation hits them, that electrical charge is dissipated and that post moves up the dial. So you can actually hold it up to light and you can actually see what the reading is. When these are issued, you should always check to see what the reading is when you're issued. And then when you're finished with your job, you hold it back up to the light and see what the reading is and then take the difference. And that tells you. 
Uh, they have advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is they tend to be very cheap. You can get them for $60 to $100 for a 0 to 200 MR uh, compared to $2,000, $1,200, $1,400. However, with DRDs, if you drop them or if they get put into an electrical field, they can essentially discharge on their own, which means they'll show you a charge even though you didn't actually get exposed to that radiation dose. And if you drop them, they can also cause that meter to break and it will just completely discharge off. Uh, there's also EPDs, electronic personnel dosimeters. These are digital self-ranging uh, dosimeters. They typically use some type of a silicone pin diode. This one is sensitive to uh, betas and gammas. And you can also have TLDs, thermoluminescent dosimeters, or OSLDs, optically stimulated luminescent dosimeters, very similar to film badges where they're hit with radiation, uh, and then they're sent off to a laboratory and they're processed and they give you your readings back. Um, why do we use personal dosimetry? Well, one thing you never want to be responsible for is bringing your workers in somewhere and then exposing them to a danger and having no idea of what that danger was. You know, that, that's not what we're in the business of doing. The first thing you should always be looking at, you know, ahead of protecting the public is protecting your workers because if you kill all your workers off, there's not going to be anyone left to protect the public. So take care of your workers. And how are we going to do that? We're going to make sure that the dose that they're getting in those CRCs is not going to be significant. How are we going to do that? We're going to give them some type of dosimetry, whether it's individual dosimetry or whether we're going to share dosimetry. There's a couple of National Committee for Radiation Protection reports on the use of shared dosimetry for situations like that. And it covers using, you know, rad IPRDs, ultra radiacs, DRDs, um, EPDs, all types of different types of dosimetry to make sure that you actually are covering what the dose is for your workers. Passive and active types. Active, you can actually see the values as you go about your job. Passive is TLDs, OSLDs, film badges, ones that it just sits on your hip and it has to be sent off to be read. I mentioned TLDs. Um, it does, sir. These are not a legal dose of record because they don't meet the NAVLAP standards, National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program. TLDs, OSLDs, and some types of dosimetry you can get from Merian or from Landauer do meet legal dose of record. They have been through a very, very strict accreditation process on how that thing records its dose, how that it, um, how it's read, and then how it, how they produce the dose, and then the reporting that they give you. But just because these aren't illegal, those are record, doesn't mean that it isn't a useful thing. These are also very useful because these can set to alarm. You can have them alarming at various doses. So once they reach, say, 100 MR, you can have an alarm and you know it's time for everyone who is being covered by that dosimeter in that area to change out. We're not going to give you any more than 100 MR. These obviously do not alarm. Yes? Yes. For a group, what would be a recommended sort of range for that group for that one group? Look into the NCRP documents. They put a like a 250-page book together on it, and then they also have a uh, report that has practical guidance on how to do it. But you know, if you consider about uh, you know the R squared rules, um, the CRCs, I'd say you know. 25 to 50 feet beyond that. So let's just do a little bit of review, survey meters. Um, first time when you pick it up, check for the calibration sticker, check the battery charge on it, check the meter response to a known radiation source, check your background radiation levels, and record the information on the, on the sheet. Let's talk about portal monitors. 
you know, when, when, I, when I started, there was no real such thing as a, being able to get access to a portal monitor unless you went over to the nuclear power plant or somewhere else that had fixed monitors. And uh, somewhere around 2000, they started coming out with these pedestrian portal monitors. And um, they, they really helped accelerate the process of being able to screen large numbers of people. The FEMA standard for nuclear power plants is you have to be able to screen, I believe, 20% of the population within 24 hours. And for areas that have low populations, you know, that, that's fine. We had a power plant in uh, Crystal River, which only had like, you know, 8,000 people in the 10 mile EPZ. Well, 20% of that, you know, 1,600 people in 24 hours, you could do that with handheld friskers. On the other hand, we also have uh, St. Lucie and Turkey Point, which both have close to 300,000 people. And if you start looking at the dynamics of screening 20% of 300,000 people in 24 hours, it's almost insurmountable. Well, portal monitors give you a much better option on doing that. Um, from 10 to 30 second count times, and you can screen somebody, um, they meet uh, FEMA standards, if, if they meet the FEMA standards, um, you can get portal monitors and screen for betas as well as gammas. Uh, the ones that we're gonna use here are the Lola Model 52. I think it's the Model 52, which actually has a series of uh, GM detectors built into the sides and then the top. Uh, the, the Johnson uh, AM801 is a scintillator base. that will also do betas. It'll do betas all the way down uh, lower than cesium 137's energy, about 200 keV betas. Um, the thermo and most of the other models are a gamma only. Uh, most of these are weather resistant. They can't hold up in a driving rainstorm, but in light rain or mist, you know, they can still continue to operate. Uh, they usually t can operate on either uh, batteries or AC power, um, $12,000 and up. They have usually a couple of different modes available. They have a walkthrough mode where you can set it to do a count. It's got some type of an electric eye. As soon as you break that eye, it starts counting. Um, you kind of have people walking through slowly. And then as they exit it, um, it'll you know, usually give you some type of an indicator of whether they were clean or not. They come in a timed count. If you need more sensitivity, you can actually set them so that they go in, they break the electric eye, they stand on top of the monitor and it starts counting them, and the time count could be anywhere from 10 to 60 seconds. You can have vehicle drive-throughs. We had a question about vehicles, uh, screening for vehicles earlier. They actually sell kits to allow you to spread the arm, the, the two posts of the portal monitor out, and whether they are going to meet that one microcurie standard anymore between the middle kind of depends on other situations, but you can at least try and uh, separate them out and see how it works. There is no calibration of a portal monitor. On the other hand, there is a standard, a FEMA Rep 22 standard for how you check a portal monitor. And it involves using a one microcurie source held at three different elevations within that monitor, usually at about five and a half feet in the middle and then down about one and a half feet and making sure that that portal monitor alarms using that one microcarry source. Now I will tell you one thing about this. We buy cesium sources at one microcarry and we save them for a very long time because cesium has a long half-life, 30 years, right? Well, after 10 years, it has been through some decay. And if you're using that 10 year old cesium on your portal monitor and your portal monitor no longer alarms, you may want to consider that it's the strength of the source rather than your portal monitor that's failing. And you might wanna get a new one microcurie source and check it on that. So do be careful about when you're using your sources to do it. Um, talked about the cesium-137 source. Uh, if those tests fail, notify the, uh, the equipment manager or your radiation safety officer on site. 
and they'll see what they can do to fix the situation. Okay, how you actually check to make sure it's operating after it's passed this functional test, uh, put a source on somebody, have them walk through. Does it alarm? If it doesn't alarm, try and determine what, what happened. Um, head level, waist level, foot level. Uh, I will tell you, depending on the type of portal monitors you have, somebody who's very tall, if they have contamination on the top of their head, it will not see that contamination. We've had people go through our Johnsons, and the Johnson does not have um, a monitor on the very, does not have a detector on the top. The guy was about 6'7 or 6'8. We put a source on the top of his head, and it never alarmed. On the other hand, if you have somebody going through one of these in a wheelchair, if they have contamination on the underside of their legs, it also may not be able to get an orientation on those to alarm. Also, if they have something on the very bottom of their feet, because some of these monitors do not have detectors at the foot level, it also may not alarm. Um, other issues, very large people could provide screening for the sources, screening for contamination, they may not alarm. Um, children, uh, small children, they're only going to be getting on part of the part of the detectors. They may not alarm. If you're using these monitors for dogs or cats, you know, consider that there's other things that could be happening for reasons that they may not show anything. Uh, The next question you're gonna ask, well, I've done all this other stuff to protect my workers. What about the air levels in there? There are continuous air monitors that are available that you can also purchase to use in CRCs. Uh, we purchased um, blade work systems from about six years ago. They were about $6,000 a piece. And for those of you who are in the field, we set them to run where they would uh, alarm at one-tenth of the alley. Um, so um, they'll actually measure the DAC hour concentrations, and then we set it so that we wouldn't exceed one tenth of the, uh, the the alley. You know, about one tenth of a DAC hour. Uh, they had visual and audible alarms, so that if they actually exceeded that value, that red siren on the top started going off, and they also made lots of noise. So, in summary. Um, we talked about handheld survey meter screening techniques, uh, one half inch to one inch above the surface, one to two inches per second. Dosimetry equipment and uses, DRDs, SRDs, uh, EPDs, TLDs, OSLDs. Portal monitor concepts, um, different types of available screening for portal monitors, beta gammas or gammas only. Um, uh, checking it. Checking portal monitors with a one microcuricesium source at three different areas within. And after you've done that, have somebody walk through with a source on them. And then using air monitors. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>